Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Keith Garner, Superintendent and CEO of Wesley Mission. I want to talk to you about an extremely personal matter. I want to talk about the genuine reality of your religion. You might well wonder about the preacher having the temerity to even address such a theme, to suggest that there may just even be a question about the reality of religion in our own lives. My response is really to the scripture that was read earlier in the service, to Jesus Christ and how he was prepared to question the religious leaders of his own day, scribes, Pharisees, those who had positions as teachers and authorities prepared to question such a reality. He said that they, by the way that they taught and by the way they did things, they laid burdens upon people that were hard for people even to imagine, let alone bear in their own lives. Burdens that were there on people's shoulders. Without, to see, another of those beautiful words, you know, there's so many in this passage here that have come into our language every day and people don't even know that they're building, without even lifting a finger to help. How many times do you hear that said about people? That they, they don't practice what they preach. They're all, all from the words of Jesus. And that they really are penetrating words, I think, for all of us. Jesus Christ teaches that true religion, real religion, frees people. Enables them to live a life where burdens have been set free. And the ethical teaching of Jesus is not at odds with the scribes and Pharisees, but the example of the teachers. As far as Jesus is concerned, he doesn't want to question so many of the things that they do. But it's, it's, as far as Jesus is concerned, it's the example of living alongside what they taught and what they said and what they actually did. It's here where we get the popular saying, do as they say, not as they do. The injunction is to do what they say, but to do more than that, to practice it. So Matthew 23 verse 3 says, do not practice what they preach. Powerful words of Jesus, really, I think, in the context of the religious leaders. No one, I've never found many religious people that want to take the title hypocrite. N nobody wants it. I, you, you can see me afterwards if you feel you are a hypocrite. If you want to be known as a hypocrite, it's not really a very endearing title, is it? But it's one that Jesus really addresses in this particular passage here. No one wants to be seen in that way. Few people want to be around hypocrites. Hypocrites are, by definition, deceptive. We sometimes say, two-faced. That's another nasty way in which we have emulated that idea that's there. You know, the Wall Street Journal told a story of a congressman who was addressing the House of Representatives. He said this. Just listen to this speech. He said, never before have I heard such ill-informed, wimpy, backstabbing drivel as has just been uttered by my respected colleague, the distinguished gentleman from Iho. Hard to hold those two thoughts in the same breath, isn't it? We want to be authentic about faith. The practice day by day of what it means to live in Christ and to live that faith out so that our religion is real. Politics have much to teach us on this difficult subject. There are many examples in the actions of politicians in Macquarie Street, Canberra, Strasbourg, London and Washington. In such a context we, we have going on at the moment, the game of gotcha. In London it's about abuse by politicians. Oh, here it's about that silly stuff. You belong to two countries. I'm the only one that can actually say that's a good thing because when the ashes come along, I can say, I can decide which team I'm supporting. <laughs> and you know, whatever else you might say, when I heard Barnaby wasn't really an Aussie, well, there's no more Aussie than Barnaby in the whole of Australia. <laughs> nobody has a, wears a hat as well as he does. Well, Catter tries to, but nobody wears a hat as well as he does. 
But it's very serious, really, because what it's about is catching people out. And in doing so, trying to destroy their lives and futures. Aspects of a personal life can be explicitly... I'm not even beginning to go to Hollywood. I'm too ashamed to talk about it. That this can happen in our day with some of the people that folks have sat in front of screens of and seen as iconic characters and figures who've written films and directed shows that people have considered important. But we see the damage that can go on to people and families. We see it at election time. We see it in that dual citizenship debate. We're regularly drawn to matters of self-importance displayed in the public eye. Theatron is the word we translate to be seen, to where, of course, we get theatre from. In the context of the theatre, hypocrisy is often demonstrated. On many a stage, a person is legitimately given permission by the, by the nature of the, the piece of work that they're doing to play the part of. We even say it, don't we? He or she is playing the part of. That's what it really means to live in, in that world of the hypocrite. On many a stage, a person legitimately has that, that title. John Dryden, the 17th century English poet, came from a large family of 14 children, born in a rectory into a strong Puritan family. His work is outstanding. Just listen to some of the words that he says. A man so various that he seemed to be no one but all mankind's epitome. Stiff in opinions, always in the wrong, was everything by starts and nothing long. But in the course of one revolving moon was chemist, fiddler, statesman, and buffoon. And Dryden was talking about human nature and all the different sides and fronts it takes on. We need the prophets, the prophets of old and the prophets of our own day, to expose our own hypocrisy. Jesus addressed the issue very directly by saying that leaders must choose which H word they're to live by. The hypocrisy or the humility. The hypocrisy that was stacked up and demonstrated by people who put burdens on other people's shoulders, demanding that they live by rules that they themselves didn't even live by. Or the humility that would see ourselves as we are. There are many things that help us to gain a sense of humility. If I just begin to scratch at some kind of understanding of, of humility in terms of seeing ourselves as we really are. Not very long ago, I was in the Northern Territory. It's a beautiful place to be when it's not raining. It's a beautiful place to be if the sky is clear and you're able to observe and see yourself in the, in the light for a few moments of the power of creation. And sometimes when you listen to the sound of a, of a gifted musician playing a marvellous piece of music, you are brought down to yourself and see yourself as someone in the light of somebody's human ability, God-given ability. And I don't think there's any place where I find myself brought low than when I hold a newborn child. And I see in some sense the joy of life. However, However, I might stack up all the ways in which I, I see myself as I am and understand what it means in the light of the humility of God. Nowhere more than looking in the face of Jesus Christ. No more, nowhere more by observing what he did, listening to what he said, grasping in some sense the meaning and power of his grace. We can't avoid the fact that religion, when it's hypocritical, often imposes a catalogue of demands upon others. And those who make such demands very often are unable to bear the load themselves. In the time of Jesus, those who practiced religion were extremely proud of their religious identity. Having said that, we need to be very careful. Jesus didn't spend his time condemning those who were Pharisees and those who were religion, religious people. But the Talmud itself, 
the very basis of so much of the, the religion that was theirs has much to say about hypocritical leadership. The Pharisees in the Talmud are described by a whole long list of descriptions. I'll just give you four. There are the shoulder Pharisees. They're the people who bore on their shoulders their good deeds. So they'd be able to walk along so everybody could see them. Look what's on my shoulder. All the deeds that are there. Then there were self-afflicting Pharisees who devoid every appearance of evil even if attracted to it. Then there's this lovely description of the humpbacked Pharisee in the Talmud. The humpbacked Pharisee who exaggerated every sense of humility so that their back was humped up with pride. And then there's a way to little Pharisee. Now this sounds as though it's a real contemporary feel. We might like this one. The feel of postponing prevaricating, putting off good at this point in time. You see, religion must never be a burden. It is not meant to be. It was not part of scripture to be. But how religion has caused people to feel the burden upon their shoulders. Jesus reminded his hearers that they must practice what they preach. It's a word for all of us. It's not enough to have the right doctrines. It's not enough to know all the laws. It's not enough to correctly commend it to others. It needs to be real. It's easy to fall into the trap of outer significance, as I think of it. In so many aspects of our life, those things that might be, if you like, the, the things that are on the outside of our religion. You see, it's okay to be thought of as a teacher, if you're a teacher indeed. It's okay to be thought of as a father if you are a father indeed. It's okay to be called a doctor if you're a doctor indeed. It's okay to be called a mother if you're a mother indeed. This is the heart of the teaching of Jesus. This is what real religion's about. Not how you say your prayers. And not how many churches you go to. Not how many times you're able to perform in religious ceremonies. It's how real it is. The reason why each of these thoughts is correct is it's not the title that makes a person. It's what they do with their life that makes a person. The worst burdens are, of course, those that we place on other people. The criticism of Jesus strikes powerfully at the scribes and the Pharisees. I can understand when I read the Gospels and listen to the mounting sense of criticism that through the teaching of Jesus they would have to hear. Sometimes directly, very often, by inferring from his stories what he had to say. Perhaps it's these burdens that Jesus had in mind when he said, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The way of Jesus is a way of religion that sets us free, or perhaps on occasions helps us to face those things that life brings to us. When our religion becomes a burden in our lives, it's invariably the result of not allowing the joy and presence of the Spirit of God to live at the heart of our experience. That truth that we find in John's gospel. So if the sun sets you free. You will be free indeed. The story is told of a father you know. Who complained. About the amount of time his family spent. In front of the television set. His children were near obsessed. With watching cartoons. And as a result. They often had poor homework marks. I hope I say this in not a sexist way. His wife liked the soap operas. She knew the storylines of them all. What was the solution? Well, he stood up one night and said to his family, as soon as the football season's over, I'm going to pull that plug out of the wall. <laughs> well, you know, beyond the, the humor, there is, there is something of the, the, the reality of hypocrisy 
that is sometimes not recognised by all of us. George Herbert, the marvellous country parson whose writings were in its own day phenomenal, once said this, no one knows the weight of another's burden, only God. The old gospel hymn, used to have the line, do you remember days are filled with sorrow and care, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted. And that's to me so important. That's what perhaps meant John, John Bunyan to write in that marvellous uh, piece of work that I still think is one of the most outstanding pieces of literature that the, that the languages of the world have ever had passed into them, the Pilgrim's Progress. That marvellous story of Christian on his journey and how at the cross of Christ the burdens were lifted from his back. The simple definition of a burden has to be the load you carry take it further. We use the word burden in many, many ways. We talk about the burden of responsibility when there are things a person has to do. We talk about an elderly close relative worries me and is a burden to me because somehow I'm identified with what it is that they're struggling with in their life. Buying houses today in the economic market in which we live places intolerable burdens on many young couples. Jesus lifts our burdens and offers a pattern of love and grace. Let me move on. Religion must never be a performance. Jesus also criticizes the scribes and Pharisees for making a spectacle of their religion. Now, the telephone has changed the world that we live. I mean, now you find people taking pictures in the most strange of contexts. I can only begin to imagine what Jesus would have had to say about it. If people were taking photographs of people's own righteousness, their religion, it must never be a performance. And, and, and he addressed that directly. He talked about the things that they wore, the, the phylacteries upon their, that, that, that were out there as, as marks upon their forehead, which had within them pieces of the Torah and the law. And the tassels, the tassels on many people's gowns that, that were worn and, and swiftly moved along as they, they conducted ceremonies in the local synagogue and at the temple. They all had meaning. Special times of the year, they, they attach fruits like, like pomegranates on the bottom of the tassels. All representing important things, but all drawing attention to the person wearing it not the truth that was there. And Jesus is not interested in performance. I'm told in the middle of the last century, you can say that now, can't you? The last century, 20th century, the last century, during the middle of it, in France, in southern France on the French Riviera, everybody liked to have in their apartments, remember many of these people came from Paris and Marseille and the great cities of France and had their houses on the Riviera. And you needed to, if you really wanted a nice apartment, you had a balcony. We can say in Australia, balconies are two a penny. But not on the Riviera they weren't. And I found this fascinating when I read it for the first time, that people even painted balconies on their apartments. So that if you sat down here and looked up, they looked as though they had a balcony, even when they didn't. Our lives can be lifted above performance when we really seek a life and walk with Jesus Christ. When we know what it is to live in close communion with him. You know, a rather pompous looking Christian leader was in conversation with a group of young people on the importance of living the Christian life. And he asked this question, why do people call me a Christian? Why do people call me a Christian? After a moment's pause, one of the young people said, well, maybe it's because they don't really know you. <laughs> With that kind of honesty that frighteningly cuts for every one of us. Jesus Christ knew all too well that some of the religious leaders were, were deep into performance, deep into demonstrating to other people their own righteousness, 
and they needed a change of direction. Genuine discipleship always speaks of love. Genuine commitment continues in the face of life's burdens. Genuine character grows out of faithful discipleship. I sometimes make for, for home, if I come in late, I would go on an occasional late night shopping trip. Especially if I've been working a very long day. There are two reasons why I do it. One, I want to be helpful at home. But the other is I can declutter the mind and, and, and can walk around the aisles of the supermarket. And usually at that time, I don't meet too many people who I know. Most of the people I know have gone earlier in the day or they haven't the money to go to, sh to supermarkets, one or the other. But one of the things I've discovered, if I, if I have the time, and in the supermarket when there's not many people there, is that cost ratios is what really matters. Cost ratios. I've discovered that some things that I thought had gone down in price, when I look carefully... I find have gone up in price. Because my tin of beans, which at one day, and I'm now telling you my eating habits and my shopping habits, all are to go. My tin of beans, which was once 450 grams, is now 330. And only a little bit cheaper than when it was 450. Now, what is he saying? He's not giving a lesson in what you do when you go shopping but really saying that it's often dress that makes something look good. We can wrap ourselves up every day in the same packaging, nice clothes, big smile, friendly demeanor, yet still be about performance and size and significance. And then thirdly, genuine religion reflects Jesus Christ. In one verse, there's a summing up of what Jesus frequently told his disciples. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Following World War II, again in France, there was an amazing movement that survived for a while, but taught the rest of the church a great deal, called the Worker-Priest Movement. The worker-priest movement was against everything that, that Catholics had until that point practiced in one of the great Catholic countries of France. And these were priests who were working in the very places where people spent their everyday lives. There was much to learn from this particular movement, whether it's priests or ministers or laos, the laity, the whole people of God. The Pharisees in Jesus' day were extremely proud of their religious identity. The tragic thing for us is that as we read the words of Jesus in this particular part of the gospel, the hypocrisy becomes so significant that people even say he's being very pharisaical. He or she is like a Pharisee. It's become, a, 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 if you like, a byword for a sham. It should never be. There are far too many examples of good Pharisees. But there were those for whom it was something outward. Francois Fenelon was a great writer on holiness in the court of the... The French are getting a good run tonight from me, let me tell you. For King Louis XIV of France, who, who was a, a king for, I think, uh, an enormous period, about 70 years or something. One Sunday, when the king of the attendants turned up for church, for the regular Sunday service, no one was there but the preacher. King Louis demanded, what does this mean? Fenelon said, I had published that you would not be at church today in order that your majesty might say and see who really serves God in truth rather than just to flatter the king. Pharisees enjoyed the best seats in the synagogues. And you know, the best seats in the synagogue were at the front. It's so different than church today. People think the best seats are at the back. <laughs> but the best seats were at the front. 
When they went to a special occasion, be it a a marriage, a, a dedication or some event, they were given prime places next to the person being recognized. Places of honor. There were so many examples of these things. Robert Redford, of course, is now an old man. It's quite frightening to see these people. You know, you remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, don't you? He's hardly got going, hasn't he? You want to see him now. The pictures of some of these guys. When I look at Clint Eastwood and Robert Redford, and I see the, the, the great actors. But they've now gone behind the, the camera. Both of those two guys, particularly, now directing and producing quality films. Robert Redford was one day in a hotel walking across after having coffee to go to his room. And somebody followed him and with great excitement said to him as he entered the lift, are you the real Robert Redford? And as the doors closed, he said, only when I'm alone. No person can wear two faces for too long. And that's where Jesus is really taking us taking us into that place of asking of us, of all of us, how real is our religion? Not just here and now, but when we go home, when the mud is flying tomorrow, in the places that we spend our days. I recall my very first appointment as a minister, and I left that appointment in 1983 to go to the other end of the country, And as I left, the caretaker, after I'd had this uh, big farewell in the the central mission there, uh, he he came up to me quietly and he said, I've I've taken off your your plate off your door. Would you like to keep it? And I said, oh, no, no, you can leave that for the next fellow. Would the next fellow want my name plate on their door? I don't think so. But it raises the question for all of us, whoever we are, And whatever we are, what really is real in our lives? And do we recognize it? Do we see it? Do we behold it? Or are we wanting to hold on to something and we don't realize what it is? We are all marked in the end by the reflection of our lives in the face of Jesus Christ. Or better still, the reflection of his presence, his name. His grace in our face and in our lives. May God give to us a real religion that makes all the difference. Amen. Amen.